Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. My guest on today's show will focus on one word, innovation, and what that means for economic development in southwestern Virginia. Greg Feldman is the executive director and CEO for Verge. Troy Kieser is director of Carillion Innovation for Carillion Clinic. Brett Malone is president and CEO of Virginia Tech's Corporate Research Center. He succeeded longtime president Joe Meredith last year. And Debbie Custer is the lead consultant on commercialization for the Vinton-based Innovation Mill. And thank you all for joining me today. I appreciate it. Let's start out, Greg. Let's talk about Verge. Uh, Verge is the recently formed alliance among three organizations, all focused on, I guess, high-tech startup growth. Who are the players and, and why the formal alliance? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, really, we felt like the region uh, needed a uh, so a coalesced approach to ecosystem building. And so uh, last year, we brought together the Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council, the Valley's Innovation Council, and the ramp program under the umbrella of Verge. And we're really about, uh, you know, ecosystem building, identifying uh, gaps in the ecosystem through research planning and uh, grant writing, uh, building community in the technology world through the uh, RBTC's membership uh, services program, and ultimately providing uh, entrepreneurial uh, services to founders of high tech, high growth potential startups through RAMP, uh, which provides uh, mentorship and acceleration services to those companies. And we've now just started our fifth cohort uh, since founding it in 2017. Is there, so uh, that's, that's what we're about, Gene. Is there strength in numbers, Greg? Does it make it easier, for instance, to attract some state money or federal money if you, if you can show that you've formed this cohesive alliance? I, it, it, I think it, it breaks down some of the siloed approaches and it does make it more attractive to grantors, whether that's government sources or even uh, entities like a Kauffman Foundation that's very much involved in the national uh, landscape of innovation building. And we're very much aligned with what the state is trying to do through the Virginia Innovation Partnership Authority, which was established last summer, as you may be aware. And they're really looking for regional actors and organizations to serve as a counterpart to what they're trying to do to drive the innovation economy across the state. Right, Brett Malone is with the, the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. And Brett, the, uh, talk about the growth there. I think it's doubled in recent years. What's fueled that growth? And describe the CRC's relationship with Virginia Tech next door. Sure, so the CRC's mission is to help commercialize uh, university research primarily at its core and that's how we got started uh, over 30 years ago uh, currently now we're a vibrant community 37 buildings 227 technology companies 3500 employees over here uh, and it, it spans the spectrum from university startups private startups as well as several publicly traded companies so we've had some successful companies that have done recently they've gone IPO uh, you know to answer your question about what makes it uh, work is the community. So we think about three things, you know, the community of these disruptors or innovators that are really trying to build uh, com build their company and their technologies. Uh, we think about the collisions that occur because we have all of this uh, activity and all of these companies sort of co-located. And one of the newest things that we're seeing is the co-working space, you know, as part of the pandemic, people are trying to figure out now how to balance work from home and, and still get into the offices. So we're, we're trying to make our space more flexible and give those, uh, those, innovative, those innovators an opportunity to grow. And we should mention, uh, Brett, you're a triple Hokie. Uh, <laughs> That's right. You, you've been involved with some entrepreneurial efforts yourself. So is, is this position now, is it sort of like close to your heart? This is in my DNA. So uh, you're right. I did my PhD at Virginia Tech in aerospace engineering. I came over here to the CRC in 1995 and started my very first company. I met Joe Meredith over 25 years ago. So that was imprinted in my DNA, so to speak, uh, very early on. Uh, for me, this position is very much a homecoming, and I'm very committed to giving back to the community. How, how, so what's the relationship with tech? I mean, if, you, if you're at the CRC, do you have to have some type of relationship with the Virginia Tech, have done some research there, and you want to spin something off or, or what? Yeah, so we, we actually are, um, 
a for-profit entity under the Virginia Tech Foundation. So we're somewhat parallel, but obviously we have a very special relationship with Virginia Tech. So we are uh, formerly a university research park. Uh, so you don't have to be associated with Virginia Tech to have place here at the CRC. We have many private companies, but what we find obviously given our loc locality, we're, we're less than two miles away from campus down here. And so we get a lot of investigators. We get a lot of professors who start companies with grad students. And so very notable companies such as Torque Robotics, they're doing autonomous vehicles. Uh, it, it was a startup out of the mechanical engineering department, uh, uh, several grad students and a professor who developed technology. Ultimately, they were uh, partnered and acquired by Daimler Chrysler trucks. So, you know, the, the benefit of being here is that we can give those investigators coming off of campus a really easy place to get going and commercialize the work. All right, Troy Kieser is with Carillion, uh, Carillion Innovation. Uh, Troy, when you know when many people hear of Carillion, they think of the hospital and healthcare. Where does Carillion Innovation fit into that picture? Uh, what's your mission, and how long has Carillion Innovation been around? Great, yeah, thank you for, for asking. Um, so Carillion Clinic, as you know, uh, serves 1 million uh, patients uh, annually. Um, we have about 75 uh, specialties and um, over 1,300 uh, employees. And then those employees, as they're performing research or figuring out how to improve care, they may discover, say, a new medical device, maybe a new health information technology application, or another innovation that may not only improve the care of the patients that we serve, but it could help patients across the country, if not the globe. So Cranelian Clinic Innovation, uh, we receive invention disclosures from those employees. So far, we've received um, over 70 invention disclosures. We assess those technologies and and for those that have that commercial potential, we offer proof of concept program funding uh, up to 50K to grow those inventions, um, prototype, test them, validate, potentially invalidate those technologies. And then once that technology has been uh, validated enough to a point, we can license those technologies to an industry partner for them to bring it to market, or we could spin out a, a company. Uh, we have several collaborations with industri industry partners to date, and to answer your question of when, uh, when we started, uh, we launched in, in 2020. So we're actually quite, quite a new department within uh, Carillion Carillion Clinic. And we have three startups that we've uh, spun out as well, one being Archive Core. It is a medical credentialing company um, that uh, facilitates uh, uh, the uh, production of, of medical, or basically being able to credential our, our, our clinicians at a much faster rate. Usually it takes weeks. Uh, this company is able to do it in, in days. I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any kind of uh, re relationship, Troy, with either the the Virginia Tech Carillion Medical School or the Fraylon Biomedical Research Institute that if, if they need to do more testing on this better mousetrap that they may get involved? Absolutely. So we have uh, a very tight relationship with the Virginia Tech School of Medicine, and we're also opening up, as, as part of my role here, relationships with the biomedical engineering group, the, med the mechanical engineering group. There's many, many departments with Virginia Tech where if we're able to take our clinical know-how and our living laboratory, the, the, the hospital, and these great engineering minds and, and partner them together to create new solutions, it's, uh, it's a really winning combination. I'm just curious before I move on, is this something that other healthcare systems do? Is this fairly unique for a hospital and a healthcare system to get involved with, with these you know, innovating products? There's about 67 uh, innovation um, uh, uh, departments um, across the, the country that are, reside within a healthcare system, and each one of them do facilitate those relationships with uh, academic partners. So it's not necessarily uh, unique, um, but being able to, to partner and, and, and bring it together and, and be able to reap those benefits is um, extremely important for us to grow our innovation ecosystem here. All right, Debbie Custer is with the uh, Innovation Mill, Inventing that's an arm of the Advancement Foundation, which also stages the annual Gauntlet Business Competition. Um, Debbie, talk about innovation at the Innovation Mill and which companies wind up, which startups wind up at the Innovation Mill. And I guess they sort of get pulled out of the Gauntlet system. Is that is that is that true many of our businesses do come out of the gauntlet some of them come from other um, entities they have found that they're not getting um, 
all of the resources that they're looking for. We do not um, provide financial resources such as Verge and some other groups do, but what we do provide is a template and a strategy for entrepreneurs who are so overwhelmed with what way to go and how to proceed and actually how to um, review a lot of the information that's coming at them. Everybody has an opinion and everybody has some advice for a lot of these new entrepreneurs and they're just being overwhelmed. And so um, Brett mentioned some of the companies that have gone through the CRC. Um, we actually worked with one of the companies that just went public about two months ago, Landos by a Pharma. So it's the ability to navigate and help these entrepreneurs navigate. So we have had several, um, our businesses that have come through the innovation mill have put over 500 jobs in the community and that goes from harrisonburg down through withville it's not just the Brunet valley it's throughout the valley we have uh, some of our companies have several patents pending some of them have had patents given um, we have put over six million dollars back into the community just by working with and listening to the entrepreneurs and helping them navigate um, grants, loans, funding, finance, things like SWAM. Um, when we have a, a female entrepreneur or a minority entrepreneur, you know, we help them navigate that paperwork. Or if you want to be a B Corp, um, so we do multiple. Um, uh, we have multiple arms going at the same time. And correct, we do get a lot of our folks from. Um, the gauntlet. Um, we've had a gentleman who developed an, a, an arrow that had GPS targeting on it for people who do high-end hunting with bows and arrows. That technology can be utilized in other areas as well. Um, we have had um, our last year gauntlet winner developed a process of tracking hand washing long before COVID, this came to her attention that there were issues in hospitals and nursing homes, schools and restaurants. And she developed a product working with other gauntlet um, alumni. She has gotten this product developed, um, manufactured and on the market in proof of concept in less than a year. That is unheard of. Mm -hmm. And this product will revolutionize how people save money and become more efficient and the domains that it's put in you know chipotle lost billions of dollars because they had to close due to their situation with um, a virus so now if you know what each individual person is doing hand washing doing it properly doing it the right amount of time the signs are great and all of that's wonderful but imagine having the actual documentation and so you'll be able to save um money each business will hospitals will schools will and so she is i mean it's a cutting edge technology and uh, one other thing i guess one of the criteria debbie for the innovation mill is that you it's got to you, you see scalable growth like almost Correct. exponential growth it has to be exactly so we look at the high growth industries currently in the world as well as in the united states and then we target those businesses sometimes there are businesses that are currently doing main street things that could actually scale change their dynamic and their strategy just a little bit and become a highly scalable company so that is what we look for um, the jobs need to be high paying jobs um, and the ability to pivot no matter what um, market they may be in mm -hmm. Let me uh, throw this out to whoever wants to talk, but it seems like the common goal here when you're talking about innovation is to help startups and small companies grow is, um, you know, creating more jobs, attracting new talent. Uh, what, what is that secret sauce? Is it, what is the thing, and let me start with, uh, let me start with Brett. What is the thing that, how do you get from, you know, I've got a better mousetrap idea, how do you get to here? Is it expertise? Is it money? Uh, is it connections? Is it some combination? I think it's a combination, but frankly, you've got to be intensely focused on serving a market, really understand the customer, and also be very willing to pivot. You know, we see a lot of people who have multiple iterations on their company until they really find the business model that works and they start generating revenue. 
you know, a lot of times um, in, entrepreneurs are, they have a, a hard time letting go of their initial idea in order to move on to a better idea. And the companies that we see that are successful are always sort of reinventing themselves until they really figure it out. And so I think our ecosystem uh, really rewards that. You know, we, we are capital constrained down here in Southwest Virginia, so we don't have a lot of capital. So companies around here are very resourceful. So they learn how to write grants and get non-dilutive funding, but they also learn how to be sort of scrappy and gritty. And frankly, I think that makes them better companies. So a lot of times what you'll find is the, the sort of the lack of capital weeds out some of these bad ideas. So the ones that really are successful really do have big impact. So, you know, we, we try to encourage people to constantly innovate on their business model and and really can until they really hit on the right uh, set of ingredients that are going to serve the market. And I know, Greg, we've talked about this before that you said that there is a lack of capital in this area for for uh, startups and all that. Is that something that is getting better? Is that one of the reasons Verge got put together? It, it is getting better and, and it requires sort of a access to a whole capital stack. You know, Brett alluded to the fact that Many of these companies, especially if they are R&D intensive, aren't going to be able to go straight to a private source like an angel group or a venture capital group. They need non-dilutive grants. Uh, and and especially if you're in uh, a domain like life sciences where you could have very long development uh, cycle time and FDA approvals, et cetera. But I think the fact that we have the VTC innovation and seed funds present is a big plus. The fact that we have an organized angel group, Commonwealth Angels, uh, operating in in the area is a plus. And there is a lot of capital out there. I think the key for us is to build bridges and relationships with, especially with um, venture capitalists have tended to become more and more specialized over time. When I first started dealing with that in the mid 80s, you, you found a lot of generalist uh, VCs out there. Today, they tend to be more domain specific. They're, they're doing SaaS software companies. They're doing uh, you know, certain biotech type of companies or what have you. And so uh, we need to link back. There are clusters in our area. Brett mentioned autonomous systems, uh, you know, life sciences and Landos. We need to build bridges to those kind of investors and make sure that we're shining a light on our region and the potential uh, in our region of the companies that really do have a long play and a, a true venture play. Uh, and so, and I agree with what Brad said. I think that, you know, sometimes being gritty and just being forced to figure it out, uh, you know, forces a, a more capital efficient uh, company to, to emerge in the long term because there are a lot of companies that we all witness get, you know, mega funding. And you'll see that a lot of that money is, essentially gets flushed until they get the right business model and, and the right validation of their from their markets uh, for their products and services. Mm -hmm. Troy, let me ask you, Troy, uh, with career and innovation, if 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 the area can really develop uh, a reputation for supporting innovation, uh, new ideas and products, and bringing them to market, is that going to help attract new talent to the area, other startups, and other people that want to live here? Something like. One of my old hometowns, Boulder, Colorado, became a very big entrepreneurial center. Uh, is is that going to help if if Carilion Innovation, for example, can show some so, show some home runs? Absolutely. Um, as we all know, money follows money, right? And so as we have these wins and continue to build upon them, um, that will definitely, definitely help our region. And to, to amplify something Greg was mentioning about um, having uh, the VTC uh, Innovation and Seed Fund, uh, which is led by uh, James Ramey, and then linking the ecosystem together, which I feel is a very unique position that our region can have. Um, there was a company, uh, there is a company, Metastream, um, who actually their CEO is a, is a Hokie alum, um, where it's an AI and uh, natural language processing platform that helps unearth uh, meaningful information from unstructured data fields. A lot of people don't realize that the medical record, the vast majority of information is in the medical notes themselves, which are unstructured and very hard to, to gather meaningful insights. So uh, as James is doing his due diligence on that company, 
Um, if you get access to um, our currently in clinic innovation and, and, and linking to other clinicians to say, you know, does this have legs? Will this truly help? And that know-how and that insight of really from those end users, those actual customers about whether or not a product has legs is immensely helpful um, for um, uh, uh, investors. So not only did they choose to invest in Metastream, as part of that due diligence, we did discover a unique use case for Metastream, a particular application to unearth information around uh, surgical uh, quality that that company hadn't even considered that particular product yet. Um, but our director of uh, surgical quality, Jake Gillen, um, said, you know, this is an area where if you're able to solve it for us, um, there's at least 5,000 other hospitals that will line up to be able to um, procure that, that product as well. Mm -hmm. So we're now collaborating with Medistream to build out this net new technology um, with, once again, that, that clinical know-how and that technical know-how, you, you bring it together and um, it can be have, have an extraordinary uh, impact. Hmm. Debbie Cussler, let me ask you about the innovation mill. When you've got someone that comes in and you think they've got high growth potential, uh, when do they hit, do some of them hit a plateau where they're just not ready to move on or they're not ready to re let go or change their business plan? It happens every day, Gene. That's a great question. Some of them don't want to change. They feel that they have lived with this for you know a year, two years, five years, and they just don't want to make a change. We just had somebody recently who has gotten some really strong grant fund, grants, has gotten some private equity funding, and all he wanted was somebody to tell them he's on the right path. And many times, you know, you can't see what others see. And so that is another um, thing that we do. We sit down, we have very honest um, conversations. And um, I also work outside of the Roanoke Valley. I work very closely with a group in um, the Tidewater area who, as the gentlemen have commented, money follows money, and they certainly have brought the money to the table. And to try to help these entrepreneurs understand what their next steps may be and how to get there. Um, we refer many people to RAMP. Um, I am absolutely going to refer somebody to Carillion after this meeting um, because we don't have the funds. And that's not something that we focus on is generating the funds. We generate the information and the strategy with the entrepreneurs and guide them to where the funds may be located. See, we're just like having a big board meeting here, you know, what the heck? It's wonderful. It's absolutely uh, wonderful. We, yeah. we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to talk about, let's talk, we ha let's bring the pandemic into this. And this is just a round table. What have we all learned over the past year as far as uh, pivoting, as far as where the remote uh, issues come in, as far as, uh, I know Ramp has been able to bring in some remote people, Greg, uh, because of Zoom and all that. But what, just go around, uh, what have we learned? I do think that this kind of technology platform that we're on today is teaching companies that they can access markets and potential customers without physically having to travel everywhere all the time. And while I think we'll return to some level of travel and, and that will become normal again, I think these kinds of technology platforms, uh, whether it's Zoom or GoToMeeting or what have you, uh, will be a, a bigger tool in the toolkit to access people Mm -hmm. from from farther away and and that's we're trying to build ultimately what's known as traded sector companies which mean that more than 50 percent of their revenue comes from outside the local market if you think about it that means money is flowing back here from someplace else and it helps generate wealth in a, in a region to a, a a faster degree than a local company that's recirculating local money that they're necessary for the local economy but um Again, you know, breaking down the barriers of distance, uh, you know, we don't have A1 flight service out of Roanoke. So if we can use these kinds of technologies to, um, you know, get to customers uh, in bigger markets uh, elsewhere, that's important. We only have about a minute or so left. I want to ask you, Brett, real quick, Brett Malone, if the train comes to Christiansburg and maybe to Blacksburg eventually, is that going to help? Yeah, of course. You know, uh, one of the things that we see is Blacksburg has a certain talent base but then other regions like Northern Virginia, Maryland. So there's a lot of talent that our companies in Blacksburg pull from in Northern Virginia. We see companies, for example, like Landos, 
that have operations here in Blacksburg where they have a lot of technical talent, but they also have operations in Northern Virginia where they can get regulatory clinical expertise. And so um, I think having that connectivity really will make a big difference in order to grow in both places. Okay, and just real quickly, Troy, is there enough talent in this area to kind of develop some of these ideas that even Corellian Innovation is working on? Absolutely. It's right here to be tapped into. Um, I especially think with the um, great minds at, at Virginia Tech and the other institutions around here to bring that together. So um, no, no question about that. All right. Uh, real quick, Debbie, your, your, your take on everything. I just appreciate the opportunity to highlight some of these entrepreneurs and their abilities here locally. Um, Troy's right. They're, the talent's here. Um, I hate it when I hear somebody's left the market let's give them the resources to build and become what they can be here locally. All right, we're gonna to have to leave it there. Greg, Troy, uh, Brett, and Debbie, thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.